Um, so, as uh, Lawrence said, uh, this uh, project was conceived as a collaboration between the University of Winchester and the New Forest National Park Authority, um, with a great deal of help and support from Frank and Lawrence in the, uh, in the project design of it. Um, it was conceived as a, a research project to tackle a particular research question uh, in the uh, uh, archaeology of the forest, but also as a training, uh, training project for Winchester students. Um, initially, I, I, I branded it as Archaeology of the Royal Hunting Lodges, plural. Um, we, uh, after two seasons, we're still looking at only one, so we dropped the plural. Uh, there's no evidence of it being royal, and I'm not even sure it's a hunting lodge. So, uh, <laughs> so hoist on my own petard, getting carried away with the, the branding um, process. Um, but obviously this is an ongoing project. We're, we've had two seasons now. Don't yet have the results of the post-excavation analysis from the second season. So this is sort of, you know, ideas are still, still coming together, really. There we go. So apologies for the text-heavy slide. This is my nod to historians. Um, <laughs> The, uh, the first recorded hunting lodge in the, in the New Forest um, is that of, uh, of King John's down at Bewley, uh, which of course he then gave to the Cistercian Order for the, the foundation of the Abbey, uh, and then relocated to Romsey. For the, much of the remainder of the 13th century, the keepership of the forest was actually in the hands of the, the reigning queen. Um, and it's not until um, you get to Edward III in the, sort of the, the middle quarter, whatever, the 14th century, that, um, that he kind of reclaims control of the uh, forest from his queen. And then from 1358, he's very actively um, setting about uh, a, a program of works, constructing and or repairing uh, a number of, of hunting lodges. And these are described in the History of the King's Works. So we have names such as um, De Parco, uh, Hathborough, Studley, Helmsley, Houndstown, New Lodge, and uh, Queen Bower. Obviously, some of these can be um, quite, um, uh, with some degree of certainty, uh, ascribed to known earthworks, and others, there's rather more um, debate. So again, I appreciate, having sat at the back before, I appreciate that you won't be able to see this, so you have to take my word for it. Um, so this is just a, basically a tabulation of, of the, um, the uh, the hunting lodge sites according to the Hans AHBR, um, so the ID numbers down the left hand side. The, the lodge site, i.e. the name that they have today on the record, um, the parish are situated in. And then um, the attempts to identify them with known sites from the, um, from the royal um, records, court records. Um, you'll see, assuming you can see it, um, that there's quite a lot of debate. Some of the sites are more um, uh, e uh, are easier to assign to um, uh, the uh, sites named in the court rolls. So Studley and Studley Castle, uh, Queen Bower, Queen Bower. Um, um, church place, so-called Church Place One, which is um, up in um, or near Ashurst, um, is quite likely to be associated with the um, hunting lodge known as Houndsdown on account of it being quite close to the current place of Houndsdown. Um, uh, some people have, have tried to claim that Church Place 2, which is um, uh, close to Lyndhurst, um, might also be Houndsdown, but I think that's probably unlikely. Anyway, this is just to give you a sense of, you know, this is um, uh, an ongoing um, debate in terms of um, the, the known earthworks and the sites that are known from uh, the various records. So, just to, uh, so if you're not sure, this is the New Forest, you might recognise it. Um, 19899 there is the site I'm going to talk about, which is Church Place 2. Um, Church Place 1 is uh, Ashurst up there. And it's interesting to note that there are uh, at least three of the um, seven or eight lodges that have a church place or churchyard um, sort of modern name. This is um, primarily, it seems, because of this, this um, perception that when the forest was established and uh, evil King William drives out all the um, uh, existing parishes and tears down churches, that uh, the earthworks that survived were associated with um, uh, churches that had been pulled down. Obviously, in, in, in these examples, we know that that's not the case. Um, only one of them has been formally excavated before. That was uh, uh, Slowden by Hayward Sumner 
who seems to have, uh, sort of, in a, in a break, a gap year perhaps, between his Roman excavations, had a crack at Slowden, and uh, failed to be particularly impressed by what he found, and wrote it off as um, probably a prehistoric cattle enclosure. Um, that was 1915, so it's you know, best, well, uh, yeah, a century, over a century, um, since the last excavation of one of these sites. And you know, his results were not particularly conclusive either way. One of the, one of the interesting aspects um, of the, um, the hunting lodges, certainly the ones that are perhaps bona fide royal hunting lodges, is the presence of um, uh, building material like West Country Slate, which is actually referred to in the royal records. Um, so some of these hunting lodges, actually, uh, slate has been found either, uh, well, normally just through sort of surface investigation or where um, you know, badgers have turned ground over or trees have gone over and uh, it's revealed some, uh, some, um, some slate. Um, but I think this is one of the things I want to come back to actually is that when we talk about these hunting lodges, that they're actually not a single entity, a single type of earthwork or structure. There's actually appears to be a diversity of, of um, types. Um, so just to get your bearings, uh, we're there. Um, Church Place 2 uh, is there um, on the, the Bewley Road. So for those that know it, just where the road dog legs and you go up towards Dennywood campsite just in there. And it's actually just sits within, just on the edge of the, the Denny enclosure. And you won't be able to see that, <laughs> sorry. Um, that's the, the OS depiction um, of, the, of the site. And one of the things, um, you know, in plan, even though what's being found on the ground or observed on the ground can be quite different at these sites, in plan, they actually seem you know, fairly similar. They're sort of 30, 40 metres squared um, uh, bank with an external ditch. Um, not, not massive earthworks. I think they're sort of they're marking the space out rather than anything particularly defensive or, or containing about them. Um, but in plan, they look very similar. Um, whether they've been constructed to a uh, designated um, uh, plan, um, uh, I'm not sure. Or perhaps they've evolved from pre-existing uh, foresters' lodges. But certainly, when you look at them on the ground, they're actually rather different in character. Um, this is the, uh, the LIDAR for Church Place 2, courtesy of the National Park Authority. I'm not to Frank and Lawrence. Um, and actually, um, the hunting lodge shows up very clearly in this. I should say that that's a little bit deceptive because on the ground, it's really not a striking earthwork. We're not talking about Maiden Castle. Um, it's very low bank, very shallow ditch. I say it's, it's largely, I think, just marking out a territory. Um, to the east of the, uh, the, the road that comes off the Bewley Road, you've got a large sand quarry. And then you have Bronze Age um, Barrow, the other side of that. And you can see this whole area, I'll fiddle with the colour ramp a little bit to make it more obvious, is a, is a, a reasonably low ridge that runs across. Um, and uh, to the north there, you have the open, open forest and the heathland. And you actually would have had a very good, clear um, field of view from, um, the, uh, from, the hunting, from the lodge site. Um, one of the first things we did um, back in February 2016 was um, uh, undertake a survey. Um, Jack Powell, if he's still around, had done some um, uh, geophysics survey as part of his dissertation at Bournemouth. And we decided to, to go uh, start from scratch, largely because it gave us a training opportunity for our own students. Um, we uh, undertook a very detailed topo survey, quite a fine resolution. We added to this during the course of the the excavation the following summer, so we got quite a good resolution on that. One of the things this shows is the, uh, the, the damage, the erosion of some of the earthworks on this side. This is the area that's been kind of a, um, described as a gap entrance uh, in, the, in the various sort of listing and scheduling documents. Um, I'm, I'm jumping ahead a little bit now, but I'm not convinced that it is a gap entrance. I think what you can see here is, is sort of water runoff and erosion and there is evidence of um, wheel rut damage as well to um, aspects of the earthwork. Um, the resistivity survey doesn't show a, a great deal beyond the, the bank and the exterior ditch. Some suggestion of um, 
uh, internal divisions, but we certainly weren't able to identify anything like that during the excavation. Um, most interesting, I think, and I will come back to this, um, is the GPR survey. Um, the lodge doesn't really show up at all, but what does show up really nicely is this feature underlying the lodge, a depth of about, um, about a foot, about 30 to 40 centimetres, a significant uh, curvilinear feature, possible causeways. Um, so I'll, we'll come back to that, so hold that thought. Um, so this is, these are the trench locations for the two seasons of excavation that we undertook. Um, they're you know, quite sort of modest um, trenches. In actual fact, um, uh, we were limited in terms of the scale of work that we can undertake. Obviously, it's a scheduled monument in a, in a protected habitat site. And we had to um, open and close trenches by hand, which added a significant amount of extra time to the work that, uh, that we did. So trench one down here, we looked at the supposed gap entrance um, to see if there was any evidence that the bank and ditch actually terminated or just petered out, um, whether there was any evidence of perhaps metalling or any kind of surface that might uh, indicate that it was a, a thoroughfare. And we found nothing to indicate that that is actually a, a formal entrance into the site. And I think, as I say, I think that adds to this notion that actually that part of the site has been quite badly affected by erosion and um, to and and froing and, and, uh, and all sorts of other things. As I say, it's, you know, the bank is sort of 40, 50 centimetres high, so it doesn't take a great deal over the centuries to erode that. And it's, of course, it's, it's a sandy geology as well, so it's very soft. Um, so trench two and trench five, we put over the bank and, uh, bank and ditch at two different points uh, in 2016. Uh, and then we follow that up with trench seven in the northeast corner. Um, obviously the aim of the game there was to try and recover material from uh, uh, the ditch fill or preferably the uh, in-situ bank material that could um, give us a date for the construction of the earthwork. Uh, and trench three, we were looking at some interior um, structures tr um, targeting some of those hints of things in the resistivity. One of the problems we had is there were some very large trees in that sort of area which meant that we couldn't look at the full extent of the uh, enclosed space. Um, trench 4 and then Trench 9 uh, this year was targeted over really the, the earlier curvilinear feature. Um, but sticking with the, um, the lodge for now, we had uh, very little by way of material culture at all from it. I think in 2016 we had eight pieces of pottery, uh, bucket loads of burnt flint, um, and uh, maybe something like 17 pieces of worked flint, which is quite nice. Um, but we did get charcoal samples from the top of, top of the bank in Trench 5 and uh, the base of the bank in Trench 2. Um, there has been no evidence from any of these trenches of internal structures. It's entirely possible that it's all in there underneath the great big uh, beech trees. Um, we had something that is potentially structural at that point, just into Trench 6, north of Trench 1. Um, but it, it's really hard to make sense of. It's a, it's a small sort of cigar-shaped feature, packed full of um, uh, gravel and clay, very compacted. It looks like it could be some kind of foundation, but it doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't, it doesn't, we know it doesn't run into Trench 1 because we excavated that, and it stops uh, it's only say, a metre and a half long in trench six. So its, its function, if it had a function, remains unclear. But that's all that we've had that might suggest any kind of structural um, activity, you know, uh, construction within the, the enclosed space. No indication of um, post holes or beam slots um, or anything of that uh, more ephemeral nature either. So it's a uh, it remains a puzzle in many respects, but it, perhaps what's more revealing is what's not there. So compared to, um, say, Church Place 1, um, where there's the West Country Slate and um, Boulderwood, um, where there are significant structures, there is nothing to suggest that this site was actually built on or occupied for any length of time. Um, and the pottery itself, um, 
was uh, fairly sort of coarse and very not royal um, in, uh, in, in character. Um, so this is just an example of the, the sections through the bank and ditch. And again, like I say, you know, it's not, it's not Maiden Castle. Um, the bank is between 40 and 50 centimetres high. Um, the ditch um, is uh, you know, correspondingly shallow. Um, the interesting thing on the ground, actually, is you can see the, the corners of the lodge, uh, the, the corners of the bank, are all um, of a greater height. And actually, it was Sumner who suggested this was simply an artefact of the way the ditch was dug and the spoil was piled up on the bank from the ditch. Um, but there is, there's no evidence of, um, you know, um, let's say, sort of occupation layers um, moving out, you know, inside of the enclosed space and very little really of um, very shallow stratigraphy, full stop. Um, and again, I apologise. When I put these slides together, I hadn't realised uh, how, uh, how dark it would seem. This is, um, uh, take my word for it, a photo of Trench 5, and it's supposed to be showing you a, the, the, the shallowness of the ditch, the, uh, the bank material there. There is actually, in Trench 5, this is at the north of the site, there does appear to be a natural... Um, a natural ridge um, that, that perhaps has been accentuated by the construction of the earthwork. So in terms of the results, as I said, we did not have a great deal of material culture, which certainly made managing the post ex rather easier than it might have been otherwise. Um, we retrieved a charcoal sample from the top of the bank material in Trench 5, and I said this was, this was right on the top, so I wasn't hugely optimistic. But it was still a little bit disappointing to get a calibrated date of um, was it 1520 to 1937 from that charcoal. Uh, started to wonder whether you know it was uh, worth going back for a second season. Um, but thankfully, the charcoal sample that we retrieved from within and towards the base of the, the bank deposit in Trench Two gave us a really nice, uh, really nice date. Um, so 95.4 percent probability of a date between. 1327 and 1450, that's calibrated, and a 91% probability that the date was actually between 1395 and 1450. So this fits really wonderfully well within the, um, the, the, the known records of this phase of, of lodge construction. The thing that it lacks, of course, is any evidence of um, high status uh, use of the site, or indeed uh, any um, uh, longer term use of the site, um, possibly rather more of a seasonal temp uh, temporary encampment. Um, the, uh, the pottery was assessed by Lorraine Meckham of um, Wessex Archaeology um, and uh, I say seven shirts, um, she was uh, very kind and didn't charge us for the, for the work. Um, but although you know, that it's partly because of the acidic soil, the, the, the pottery does not survive well anyway, particularly the sort of coarser stuff uh, at this site. Um, where she was able to identify likely um, fabric types or typologies, they were predominantly of the Laverstock courseware type, so again, uh, 13th to 15th century. Um, one possible piece of fineware, but the rest really sort of, you know, quite coarse uh, material. So I, I, I think, as I say again, I think what we're looking at here is, is something, if it is part of the hunting lodge kind of complex of sites, this I think is much more likely to be maybe some kind of ancillary um, encampment, maybe a beater's camp or something along those lines. But um, I don't know, it's, it's really hard to, to, uh, to judge. Um, certainly the dates suggest, uh, and, the, and the layout of the earthworks, the similarity with some of the other sites in plan at least, suggest that this is part of that, that program of, of works. Maybe it, was, maybe it was delineated by earthworks but never actually um, used uh, as a site. So maybe it was just a temporary encampment, a very seasonal affair um, and not, not used um, to the same extent as some of the other sites. Returning uh, in conclusion to the curvilinear, Ironically, as I said, we start off with this branding, Archaeology of the Royal Hunting Lodges. Possibly the most interesting feature of the site <laughs> has actually not been medieval at all. Um, the curvilinear feature that showed up very nicely in the GPR um, has, uh, is probably also the reason that we've found um, 
and um, probable evidence for a late Neolithic, early Bronze Age um, settlement. Again, this refers back to the other um, papers that have talked about um, absence of Neolithic. Um, we may actually have a late Neolithic site here. Um, the, the curvilinear runs underneath the hunting lodge. It's about 30 centimetres underneath the lodge. I have to say, without the GPR, I don't think we would have known it was there. There's no evidence. It's, it's sealed by what seems to be um, you know, either a windblown sand or a, 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 you know, a naturally formed soil. There's no evidence um, archaeologically. We only knew it was there because the GPR told us it was there. So we were very lucky in that point of view. One of the pieces of pottery that Lorraine looked at, um, and again, we're talking about small sherds, but she thinks quite likely that it's a uh, fragment of domestic beaker um, ware. Uh, and of the work flints that were looked at by Matt Levers, also of, of Wessex, um, there are some uh, suggestions of Mesolithic work flints, but there is also a significant quantity, well, a significant quantity within the 15 work flints that we had, um, of, uh, of Neolithic, uh, late Neolithic, early Bronze Age um, uh, uh, work flint. And although we haven't had the post done for this summer's work just yet, um, that will be coming uh, shortly, um, certainly the evidence suggests that we have a very similar assemblage from, from this summer. So 13th, 15th century pottery and some quite nice worked flints, um, probably of the same period. So the next step will be to jettison the medieval altogether probably and focus on the um, on the prehistoric curvilinear thank you